And you're uh, famous for criticizing the mainstream economics mm -hmm. and for having predicted the financial crisis in 2008. And now you're here to share your view on Norway's economy mm -hmm. and uh, how the current state of uh, the economic field. Thank you. So well, thanks. Give me a warm applause. Okay. Thank you. Great audience. I'm actually a regular visitor to Nora. I was. It's circumstantial reasons. I haven't been here for a couple of years. But a good colleague of a good colleague and friend of mine is based at the Norwegian University of Technology in Trondheim. I think I've been there over the last 20 years, probably about 15 times. So uh, quite a regular visitor to Norway. And I'd like to. I'm glad to be renewing the habit of coming here after not being here for a couple of years. Um, anybody who got a copy of Debunking Economics? Well, only one. Okay. <laughs> no, ten. No, that's not too bad. A new book coming out in April, which I'll talk about a bit uh, later on. Um, now, what I want to focus on is, is the if there's anything which distinguishes my work on economics from, from most other economists, it's focusing on the role of private debt. And if you look at what most economists and most politicians talk about, they panic about government debt. So this is just a very recent, I think two days yesterday, article in the uh, Guardian newspaper uh, with a study from the Institute, Institute for Fiscal Studies warning of a huge tax burden and saying that uh, slower economic growth will leave Britain with a, a black hole in public spending, meaning the government has to eliminate £34 billion pounds worth of expenditure, which is a huge proportion of the English GDP, uh, to, to survive. That's how bad it is. Really panic, panic, panic stations. Now, you'll find some mainstream economists dissent from this, not a reasonable number actually now saying, look, it's not a time to be doing fiscal restraint. And Paul Krugman is one of them, though he may have changed his tune after Obama ceased being president, which I find slightly suspicious. Okay. I'm certain he was angling to be Secretary of Treasury under Clinton. Okay. That's one reason he's so devastated by what's happened. There, there goes his potential retirement career. Uh, but he also, even though he's now he's agreeing now and saying we should, he's actually arguing for cutbacks in America, which I think will be an amusing thing because I actually think that's what, that's what I expect Trump to actually do, by the way, first off, uh, following this sort of advice. But like most of the mainstream, he says, don't panic about private debt. And he actually ridicules people who worry about private debt, not just me, many, many others. And his basic punchline is to say debt is money we owe ourselves, therefore we can forget about it, it cancels out, only the distribution matters. So here's he's showing UK, I think that's UK public debt as a percentage of, yes, that's public debt, not private debt, and saying don't worry about it. But he also applies this to private debt as well and actually argues that rising debt could be a good sign. And he gives an example, he gives a, a, child, a childish example uh, in his newspaper, but there's a more serious one I'll talk about in a moment. And he says, well, you know, more debt can be good because people have got better investment opportunities, borrow from people who don't have such good opportunities, and the next good debt can allow the economy to grow faster, and therefore that's a good thing. Don't worry about debt at all, private or public. Forget about both of them, uh, except now that Trump's in power, then you worry about public debt. So should you trust them? Okay. Well, a quick quiz. What do you think would have been the most successful way to design public policy in this millennium? Not what actually was done. What would be the most successful policy? What do you reckon? Well, here's my suggestion. Listen to what mainstream economists tell you to do and do the opposite. Okay. Because if you take a look at what the OECD had to say, and of course the OECD is one of the bastions of mainstream economic modelling and mainstream economic thinking as well. In June of 2000, that's two months before we now record the crisis as having started, August 9, 2007 has taken as the starting date of the crisis. And writing in June, two months before the crisis, the OECD chief economist said that uh, the slowdown was not heralding worldwide weakness uh, and recent developments they reckon have confirmed their prognosis. The current situation is better than we've experienced in years. Uh, we've stuck to our rebalancing portfolio. Our central forecast remains quite benign. Okay. You don't have cancer, okay? Don't worry about the lump on your back. You don't have cancer. We're going to have a soft landing in the United States, strong and sustained recovery in Europe, strong job creation and falling unemployment. 
Now, the sensible response by policymakers to that, panic stations. Okay? There's a crisis coming. That's not what they did, of course. They took the economists seriously. Now they're starting to question them. This is the unemployment rate for a large number of countries. That prediction by the OECD about strong job creation and falling unemployment was made there two months before the crisis began. Unemployment more than doubled in America in the subsequent two years. That's the rise that occurred at that stage. So taking them seriously, they're due into a trap. Doing the opposite of what they recommended would have been a good idea. And they, not only did they not see it coming, which it means a financial crisis using the way Hyman Minsky described it. By the way, if you want to read a great book, very readable, on financial crises and why they occur and the type of economics you should study, buy a copy of Hyman Minsky's Can It Happen Again? Book of readings, maximum length of any of the readings is about 20 pages. He writes beautifully over a short distance, not so well over a long one. Don't buy stabilising an unstable economy. He had no idea. He just repeated himself in a bad way from what he wrote brilliantly in a book called John Maynard Keynes before that. But stable, Can It Happen Again? Great set of readings. Very easy to get digest. And, and cheap, about 15 I think about $15. No, so they, they didn't see it coming and they didn't recognise it when it arrived either because this is the Federal Reserve's chief economist, the, the director of their research division, in December of 2007. That's four months after the crisis began. And again, using the same sort of mainstream models that didn't see the crisis coming, what he says is, well, there's a, the fallout from the slump, financial turbulence, Increased energy prices, which is happening at the same time, that's why you got a surge to inflation, will give a sub growth for the next several quarters, but then we'll get a levelling off of oil prices, gradual improvement in financial conditions, growth picking up toward potential okay. in 2009. Our overall forecast is still a pretty benign picture. Despite all the turmoil, we avoid recession and we get slightly to higher, higher prices and so on modest edging off of inflation. The NBER now dates the crisis from starting in the month he said there wasn't going to be a recession. In terms of that, that's when they date the actual American recession of having started. And that's how wrong they were. So if they say, on that basis, I mean, my little piece of logic here, if they say high public debt is a worry, then it probably isn't. And if they say high private debt isn't a problem, then it probably is. So I'm going to start, first of all, taking a look at the private debt issue and take a look at this two-class model that Krugman goes on about. But rather than looking at the toy model he published in the New York Times, I'm using one you can find online as an appendix to the published article in the Quarterly Journal of Economics where he claims to be building a Fisher-Minsky Kerr model of uh, the economy. And th at the very end of that appendix, there's a trivial model, in my opinion, uh, for example, the, the, the bank in this situation, so-called bank, is not a bank. It's a contract to exchange debt, and the debt is not in money. It's in a consumer good. So it's a trivial idea of what money is. But what he has in that model fundamentally and what he thinks about the way money is created, and this is common to, to neoclassical economists in general, there's one exception. There's a good friend, Michael Kumoff. Uh, but they basically pretend that banks are intermediaries. So banks don't actually originate loans. Uh, and in this model, what he has is a consumer good agent. I'm going to work with the consumer goods sector when I show you my model. A consumer goods producing agent who is the lender and a borrower who's the investment goods producer. And the bank simply acts as an intermediary and charges a fee to the consumer agent for introducing them to the investment agent and enabling the loan to take place. So I've got a software package called Minsky. Has anybody seen or downloaded? Has anybody downloaded Minsky? Yeah? Hey, great. One taker. Um, hopefully others. It's a system dynamics program. Again, the reason I visit Norway so much is my friend in Norway is one of the leading uh, developers of system dynamics logic in general. That's Trond Andresen up at the uh, Norwegian Institute of Technology. He teaches the first year course on system dynamics there. So I've built a system dynamics program specifically for building models of monetary dynamics. And when I, what it does, it's different to any other program, is it uses double-entry bookkeeping, which is accountants' way of visualising financial flows to generate financial equations for a, a dynamic model. And what's going on here, if I can just point up here, you can see all the various operations, lending, repaying debt, interest payments, paying a bank fee, hiring workers, purchasing goods, consumption and investment. 
they're all shown as double entry uh, transfers from one account to another. So when the consumer sector lends to the investment sector, that's the flow of money going from one to the other. When the investment sector pays interest to the consumer sector, that flow goes the, the other way. And when the consumer sector pays a fee to the up to the investment to the bank for making the arrangement, that's the transfer that occurs here. And all the other operations are shown down here. So wages being transferred and so on. I think it's fairly easy to read, much easier to read than it would be using the flowchart dynamics that dominate most other uh, all, all the other system dynamics programs. What Minsky does as well is make sure that all your rows sum to zero. If they don't sum to zero, you've made an accounting mistake. Okay? So just making sure your logic is okay. Now, when I put that together, anybody know I've got two ifs on my, two ifs on my if there? Any mathematical students in the room? If and only if, yeah. Okay, then they're right. If Trubin is right that banks are just intermediaries, it wouldn't matter. Uh, you can really ignore the financial system. So I'll bring up Minsky here for that particular model. And what I've shown you is the bank's view of the economy. I've also got the investment good sector, consumer good sector, and the workers' view of the economy. And over here I've got controls. That the text really fairly hard to see from the back of the room there. Uh, but they vary the rate at which loans occur and the rate at which repayment is made. And I've got loans doubling every seven years, roughly speaking, and repayment halving debt levels every nine years. That gives you an increase in debt over time. And we've now been simulating for 700 years now. You can see GDP is flatlining. Growth is zero. The debt to GDP ratio is high, but below the money stock. Now, if I increase the rate of lending by reducing how long it takes loans to double, notice there's a bit of a drop in the growth rate, but it then recovers. The debt ratio has risen. If I now drastically slow down how fast people repay debt, you get a huge increase in the debt ratio. Frankly, what happens to GDP and growth rate bugger all? You can ignore it and go right back down to rapid repayment and very slow lending, huge changes in the debt level, nothing really happening to GDP. So all those changes, you can see huge changes in debt. Yeah. Why worry about it? doesn't matter. Okay. That's the perspective that they have. And strictly speaking, if they were correct that banks were just intermediaries between borrowers and, say, and, lend, and, and, uh, and lenders, they'd be correct. You could ignore the financial system. Now, that's the question. Are they just the Ashley Madisons of money? Okay. Do they just introduce you to somebody else who wants to screw you? Okay. Or are they the red light district of debt? Do they want to screw you? I'll let you think on that one for a while. Okay. Well, if they are, the Ashley Madisons, the Lonely Vulnerable Funds model, then everything would be fine. You could ignore them. But for decades now, you, would go, you can go back a century to find non-Orthodox economists arguing this case, but in the mid-70s you, you had people like Basil Moore doing empirical research and saying, look, that simply can't explain how banks actually function. And Richard Werner has now actually gone and done an individual test of money creation. I've linked to the article there. And three years ago, to thank their cotton socks, the, the Bank of England came out and sided with the non-mainstream. A wonderful article. None of us had any, I knew the people writing the article. I didn't know they were publishing it. It was a surprise when it came out. Money creation in the modern economy. Highly recommended read. And that they say in that, a very mild, very English understated uh, document in general, the reality of how money is created differs from the description found in some economic textbooks. Some is code word for virtually every last damn one of them. The only exceptions you'll find are written by non-mainstream economists. Rather than banks receiving deposits and then lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. And in normal times, the central bank doesn't fix the amount of money in circulation, so it's not in control of the physical money supply, nor is central bank money multiplied up into more loans deposits. The money multiply model is nonsense. In fact, it violates the laws of accounting. Uh, so that's what they, they've come out and said that in general. Now, when I model that in Minsky, all I've got to do and I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll try to do it live. One of this is Minsky being a, a development software with only about a, a quarter of a million dollars worth of development time and uh, money into it. Uh, some things don't. When I change some things, it, it slows the program down. But what I can do is bring up Minsky and I can say, well, it's nonsense to say that the debt is an asset of the consumer sector. So I'll delete that. And all the lending and repayment and stuff that occurs doesn't occur between the consumer agent and the uh, investment agent, it's something the bank does. So I can come across here and say, in fact, the asset 
uh, the debt is an asset of the bank, not an asset of the consumer sector. And if I then say, well, the interest payments are actually made to the bank rather than to the, pardon me, type dropping that while I put that down, rather than to the, rather to the invest the consumer sector, and the bank fee is nonsense. I need to do more than that to get the model properly corrected. But having done that, simulated again, notice the differences. Positive growth rate, GDP is growing, rising debt is associated with a rising level of, 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 of money as well. And if you have an increase in the level of rate of lending, the growth rate rises. If repayment slows down, it rises even more. But then if you have a reversal, if people then start paying the debt off more rapidly and lending happens more slowly, you have a financial crisis. The economy slows down. All I've done is change the assumption that banks don't create money across to the reality that they do, and that's the difference the model makes. So that's how wrong the mainstream is and how simple it is to show that they're wrong on this particular issue. Private debt matters. Now, they can't understand why this is poor logic. That's why they get Nobel Prizes for it okay, in economics. Aggregate demand in the economy is not just the turnover of existing money, which is the strict monetarist theory. It's the turnover of existing money plus credit. And I can show that very simply and very logically. So you've got to do a bit of thinking here to follow the argument. I'm going to divide the economy into three sectors. That could be the household sector, the firm sector, the and the asset markets. I'm including asset markets in my thinking now. Uh, an aggregate expenditure in this economy will be the negative of the sum of the diagonal of all the expenditures taking place. Aggregate income is the off diagonal. It might look a bit strange, but I'll show you when the table comes up. I'm showing all flows in dollars per year. And any stocks, there's only one stock that turns up is in dollars, which of course is the level of debt. And what I'm looking at first of all is modeling an economy where there's no borrowing or lending. So you have three sectors and expenditure by sector one is A plus B per year. Sector one spends A dollars per year in sector two and B dollars per year in sector three. Ditto for sectors two and three. So when you add it all up, on the you take the negative of the diagonal, that's aggregate expenditure. Take the positive, of course, of the off diagonal elements, that's aggregate income. The two are necessarily equal. That's the whole idea that expenditure is income. Easy enough to follow that one? Now let's take a look at the next stage where we allow the, the Ashley Madison model of lending, that banks are ag agents who introduce borrowers to lenders but don't actually originate. So therefore, to borrow money, you've got to borrow from another sector. But that means if there's a flow of money from one sector to another, not a flow, not a purchase now, but a flow of money which is used to borrow. So when I'm going to have a sector one borrowing L dollars per year from sector two and paying Rho dollars per row interest rate of Rho percent per year on the outstanding debt. So they've got to be, if there's a flow of debt, there has to be a stock of debt as well. So that's why sector two is lending to sector one because it wants the income. So what I'm now including is a flow you can see going from here of minus L coming out of, out of, uh, Sector one plus L turning up over here. So sector two is lending money to sector one, and sector one then spends that money on sector three. I could make it more general, but that would just make the notation more complicated without changing the basic idea. And the reason sector two is doing that is because sector one will be paying an interest on the outstanding debt. Okay? Now, when you add up the, the, the diagonal elements, take the negative, you get aggregate expenditure, and that includes gross financial transactions. If I'm, not, I'm not showing deposit payments here, but if I had payments on the deposit accounts, that would also turn up as a positive, not a negative in that, in that row. But here's gross financial transactions becoming a part of expenditure. And the income, the off-diagonal elements, you add them up, you see it's turning up there as well. So not credit, but interest on outstanding debt is now part, and, and, and deposit accounts as well, that's part of aggregate expenditure and aggregate income. So we, the, the neoclassicals don't know their own model well enough to realise that. Now, what about if I include where you're borrowing from the bank now? So rather than borrowing the money from another sector, the bank extends a loan to you of L dollars per year, and you spend that L dollars per year buying money off another sector. So I've got sector one borrowing and spending that money buying goods from sector three. And you therefore pay interest of row times capital L dollars per year, not to one of the other sectors now, but to the bank. So I've now got to include the bank's activity here. So I have the bank having an outstanding stock of L dollars and any lending L dollars per year. 
to sector one, which sector one spends on sector three, and then paying interest to the bank of row times capital L dollars per year. Add up your diagonals, take the negative, there's aggregate expenditure, it now includes credit. Do the same thing for the off diagonal elements, that also includes credit. Okay. It's quite simple, it's quite logical. All you have to do is think more deeply and not be superficial in the way that Krugman quite characteristically is. So change in debt, and the rest of the neoclassicals as well, except Michael Kumoff. So change in debt, change in debt, which is identical to credit, plays an essential role in both aggregate expenditure and aggregate income, and also net capital gains. That's where the capital gains from selling shares comes from and selling houses comes from as well. So you've got to think about the economy as a monetary entity. You cannot model capitalism without money, which is what neoclassicals have been doing for 150 years. That's why we haven't seen this stuff coming. And you see two sources of expenditure, turnover of existing money plus new expenditure financed by debt. Now, by ignoring this, by saying it doesn't matter, they've led us into the biggest debt trap in human history. This is using normalised data. I had to, uh, the, 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 the data up to 19, 1952 on uh, is Federal Reserve data. The data before that comes from the Census Bureau. There were three series vast, vastly differing in their levels, but in the overlaps having exactly the same uh, structure. So I've renormalised the earlier data to be consistent with the later data. And you can see there that the level of debt we got in the great the global financial crisis far exceeds the peak in the Great Depression, when that rise during the Great Depression was caused by deflation. And people were actually paying their debt down between 1930 and 1932-33. It rose because GDP fell faster than the debt fell itself. So that's the level of the trap we've got into, courtesy of those theories. And both the level of debt and the rate of change matter. And the economy can crash just because the rate of growth of debt slows down. It doesn't have to go negative, but it does normally during a crisis like that. Because I'm just saying that aggregate demand is turnover of existing money plus credit, I can show you with a low level of debt, you can have a slowdown in the rate of growth of debt and it doesn't cause a crisis. So imagine you have an uh, economy of a trillion dollars a year turnover, and that's growing at 10%, working in nominal terms here. And private debt is 50% of GDP, or therefore 500 billion, and that's growing at 20%. Now, both these figures are well within the, per, the range we've seen for actual data. 10% rate of growth of nominal GDP, 20% of debt, that's a common situation in the last 20 or 30 years for many economies, including Norway. So total demand is going to be 1.1 trillion. It's a, 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 a trillion dollars from GDP turnover of existing money. And 20% of $500 billion in credit, that's the growth in credit, which will be $100, $100 billion. So total demand year one is $1.1 trillion. Next year, I'm just presuming GDP continues growing, so it reaches $1.1 trillion. But the growth of debt slows down to being the same as GDP. So rather than a rising or rather than debt ratio falling, it simply goes, it stays constant for a year. Credit, therefore, will be $60 billion. That's 10% of the $600 billion that debt now is. So you add that to the $1.1 trillion of turnover existing money, and you get total amount of $1.16 trillion. Now, it's lower than it would be if debt continued growing at the same rate, but it's still $60 billion higher total demand than the year before. So to be a slowdown in, in growth and asset so, profits from asset sales, but not a crisis. What about if it's 200% of GDP? By the way, can anybody know what Norway's current private debt level is? Anybody know? Compared to GDP? Okay, 240%. So imagine an economy with a trillion dollars GDP again, growing at 10% per annum, but private debt is less than Norway's current ratio, 200% of GDP, such so debt of $2 trillion in that case. Growing at 20%, so the growth in credit in this first year will be $400 billion, and therefore total demand will be $1.4 trillion. Now, if the next year GDP continues growing, so it reaches $1.1 trillion a year, but growth of debt slows to the same as GDP, so the ratio stabilises, credit will be 10% of $2.4 trillion, which is $240 billion. Your total demand will be $1.34 trillion, which is $60 billion lower than the year before. So even stabilising the debt ratio is not enough to stop a, a crisis. You will have a fall in total demand 
plus total capital gains. So both the level and the rate of growth matters for that reason. Now, we don't measure turnover of existing money, unfortunately. We feasibly could do it these days, but we don't. What we do measure is GDP, and GDP is mainly these days, because most debt is created for asset purchases, GDP is mainly financed by turnover of existing money. So there's a 10 to 30% error in adding the two together, but it's the best I can do at the moment. So I'm going to use change in debt, GDP plus change in debt as a guide to total demand in the economy. And now, was the 2008 crisis a black swan? Only a black swan if you were in neoclassical goggles. Okay? Because when you take a look at that figure, you can see the crisis began when the rate of growth of debt slowed down. Again, it didn't have to turn negative. Credit was growing at 15% of GDP at the peak. It fell to minus 5% at the trough. And then it started to grow again, which is why the economy has apparently recovered. So that's how obvious the data is for America. What about Norway? <coughs> this is looking at debt-to-GDP ratios over a number of countries. The deep red line is Norway. So you've got more than 2.4 times GDP as your private debt level. That's about 100% household debt and 140% corporate debt. But you can see you've got the highest debt level, far higher debt level than America had at the crisis and far higher still now. So you've got yourself into a very levered position and I think you're going to wear the consequences pretty shortly. So you're not going to have as big a financial crisis as you had in 2010 because you're not, the, the level of credit hasn't got to be as high back then but I think you're going to experience another credit crunch when the rate of growth slows down, and it's already starting to do that. That's the, that's the same effective chart I showed you for America a moment ago, but the numbers are far higher. So rather than credit being 15% at the peak as it was in America and minus 5 at the trough, for you it was plus 35% of GDP and about minus 7 at the trough. That's the crunch you had back in 2010. Now, you've recovered out of that. You're borrowing money once more. The zero point where credit is neither positive is zero is this line here. You're heading back down into it again. Now, you're not going to be as steep, I think, because you don't have as far to fall. But you're still going to have a credit crunch coming out of it, and you're going to have stagnation occurring afterwards, which is the situation America has been in as well. Also, of course, worth pointing out, your GDP is also falling, I presume, because of impacts on the price of oil. Now, the reason credit is so important is because it's, not only is it big compared to GDP these days, it's also the most volatile component. <laughs> GDP can't go negative, credit can. GDP can't increase by 20 or 30% in one year, credit can. And when you, therefore, when you graph it, the bigger the level of debt compared to GDP, the more this correlation sticks out. Now, again, according to mainstream economists like Krugman, this is zero. And I'm sick and tired of having to say, Bloody hell, minus 0.91 is a bit bigger than zero in magnitude. Okay? That's the correlation. Unemployment is driven by change in debt. And when you look at the change in credit, which is acceleration of debt, you get this sort of correlation. America is a great economy to use for this sort of stuff, but just because despite the extent to which it has been ravaged by free trade, as, proof, as, as Trump proper, rightly argues, uh, it's still... The, probably the most self-contained economy on the planet. And therefore, most of what you see happening is driven by domestic factors rather than international. That's the correlation of the change in credit, which is the acceleration of debt, to the change in unemployment, minus 0.87 over the last 28 years, 26 years. You know. Again, I'm told this is, we assume this is zero. If you assume this is zero, go live on another planet. So Norway, what about you guys? Well, I said you are more export focused, so the correlations aren't as strong, but they're still there. That's the correlation of change in of credit, which is change in debt to unemployment, minus 0.68. You can see the impact now of that credit slump I pointed out earlier on the rise in unemployment at the time. The recovery, because you've gone back into credit again, is starting to rise once more because credit demand now is far lower than it was before the crisis. And it'll never, it'll never get back to the same levels after a crisis like that with the level of debt you had. And again, the change in credit and the change in unemployment, not as strong a correlation, again, because you're much more exposed to international factors than America is. You benefited out of the huge increase 
in the oil price that occurred in the last few years. But again, you can see the decline in massive plunge in credit, change in credit, increase in unemployment. So that's the world we live in. Now, important question. Is Norway having a housing bubble? Answer, is the paper Catholic? <laughs> You've got remarkable figures for your household debt level. This is comparing household debt to GDP rather than to household income. It's a far higher ratio, of course, when you look at household income alone. So you had a bubble. In 75 to 85, you were quite restrained in your private debt level. You then had a bubble from 85 to 90, correlating with the 87, 89 uh, bubble in America and, the, and the, the, the precursor to the subprime, the savings and loans crisis. So you went from 45% of GDP to 70%. Then you delevered quite impressively across the 90s, but bang, it went back into borrowing money again and crazily in uh, 2001 through. And that's you increased from 55% to 100% of GDP in the last 15 years. And you can see this like forever increasing house price. Now, one thing I get, people who are house price lobbyists will show me charts like that and say there's no housing bubble. Why? Because it's just going up. I can't think of a better bullshit argument than that. If it was horizontal, that'd be fair enough. This is actually including, uh, this is not deflated. I don't have a good figures for them. It showed no CPI, so I haven't deflated. This is nominal prices. But your house prices have risen uh, by a factor of seven since 1992. Consumer prices have not risen by a factor of seven. Incomes certainly haven't risen by a factor of seven. So it's a bubble, unless you can explain why that should keep on going. I'm going to throw a bit of maths at you here because the usual dismiss, think to, dis, to raise and dismiss, this is what Krugman does about money. It's what I find the property lobby does about house prices as well. So Krugman says, oh, assets, somebody's assets, somebody else's liability, who cares? Doesn't think any deeper than that. Housing lobby says it's all about supply and demand and they say supply is too tight and ignores demand completely. I want to take you through a bit of maths for a, a credit, credit aware analysis here because the monetary demand for houses is overwhelmingly new mortgages, which is change in mortgage debt. Okay? That's 90% or more of demand for houses. If you divide that by the current price level, you get a rough proxy for how many houses can be purchased, like average houses. So the flow of demand is the change in mortgage debt divided by the price level. Supply is the turnover of some fraction of existing stock, and that fraction is time varying as well, plus new construction, net new construction. So you can call it alpha times the current housing stock plus the rate of change of the housing stock. So what drives prices? You know, does house prices drive mortgage debt or vice versa? That's, that's the question I want to answer here. So you start from saying there's some sort of relationship between demand and supply, and I've shown demand as being physical demand, Per, per year for houses, change in mortgage stock divided by the price, the price level, somehow related to the supply. If you rearrange that, you get the price is somehow a function of the ratio of change in mortgage debt to the supply of housing. And if you differentiate that, what's the rate of change of prices, then you get a differential. Notice when I've got a differential of a differential. I've got acceleration of mortgage debt turning up there along with change in house prices. So you expand it out a bit gets a bit messy, substitute that the price level can be approximated by the change in mortgage debt divided by the supply of housing. That gets rid of that particular term. What you finally get is this expression, expand it, looks like a mess, not as complicated as it could be because I'm not including current financial, current turnover existing money as part of the argument, but you've got debt acceleration turning up there and supply acceleration turning up on the other side. So the acceleration of mortgage debt and the acceleration of housing supply are positive and negative factors, respectively, for the rate of change of house prices, now, which is in the driver's seat. Very, very hard to work out causation in general, and economists have a, have a pretty dreadful way of doing it called Granger causality, which is entirely linear. But even using Granger causality, I've recently shown, working with Paul Armrond and uh, I've forgotten my, my second name's, second author's name all of a sudden, it'll come to me. Uh, we've confirmed using Granger causality that mortgage debt drives house prices, not vice versa. So what's actually causing the bubble is mortgage debt, and you've got to therefore bring it under control to avoid a bubble, which, of course, you haven't done. Now, when you look at the American data, this is the data we've done our regression on, 
you find that sort of correlation between acceleration of mortgage debt and change in house prices, 0.85. I think that's fairly conclusive in a correlation. We've also now done the causation. The Norwegian isn't quite so powerful, but it's still there. Remember how those two series were quite different. The level of mortgage debt and the level of house prices look very different. I think you can see the correlation there. It's acceleration of mortgage debt causing change in house prices. You've let acceleration of mortgage debt get out of control, as every other country on the planet has done, because they're following mainstream economists who don't understand this stuff. So you've got a housing bubble and you'll have a housing crash at some stage. Now, we're living in a permanent crisis mode now. The, the, the term neoclassical is coined for secular stagnation, which is nonsense. It's credit stagnation. The reason we're still in a crisis is that we haven't delivered enough. If you look at the Great Depression, the, those three lines all start from the beginning of the crisis for the United States in, two, in 1930, for Japan in 1990, and for America in 2008. So the index starts at 100. You can see the huge increase in debt because of de deflation in America in the 1930s. But even by the same time period after the crisis began as now, the level of debt back in the 1930s was about 10% below the level America is at now. Then you had the Second World War, meaning that by the end of the Second World War and the Great Depression, debt was down to one third of the level it was at the beginning of the crisis. So the reason America had its boom economy in the 50s and 60s was it didn't have much debt. Therefore, credit command could be big and the increase in, in debt payments didn't create a large drag on the economy. Japan, on the other hand, is doing worse than America. Japan crisis began in 1990. A quarter of a century later, it's still down to only 80% of the debt level that it had when the crisis began. That's why they've been in stagnation. America has now joined them, and the rest of the world is doing the same thing. And that's why I've done this in part of my book. Uh, what I've done is take a look at this brilliant database the Bank of International Settlements has done. The BIS, by the way, is the only international organisation which can hold its head high. It was because of under Bill, under, uh, Bill White, who was its research director, he understood Hyman Minsky, and he was warning Greenspan to Greenspan's face that a crisis was coming. And Greenspan stared him down and refused to listen and, and basically intimidated the other central bankers every six months, don't listen to Bill White. Bill White was right. And, and, and people have continued his tradition since then. So they now have a database freely available showing credit debt levels and house price levels in, 40, I think, 43 countries now. And using that, I've identified on the horizontal axis the, the, debt, the ratio of debt to GDP, on the vertical credit, which is change in debt, how fast that's growing, and the danger zone is anything above 1.5 times GDP and credit above 10% of our GDP in any one year. Now, that's putting a number of countries in the, in the danger zone at the moment and includes Norway. Now, I wrote this slide well long before I was invited for this talk. You'll find me mentioning Norway as one of the countries I expect to have a crisis in the book uh, and maybe Singapore and Malaysia and Thailand because they're moving into that region. The United States and UK, on the other hand, have had the Japanese experience and now much at the same level as Japan. They've got too much debt, therefore they can't have much credit demand and therefore they have stagnation because the part of demand we've taken for granted for the last 70 years is no longer there. But Norway is one of the vulnerable countries in that mass at the bottom there with a debt level of 2.4 times GDP and credit demand being 10, greater than 10% of GDP. So you're vulnerable to a slowdown. I think you're going to cop one uh, in the next one or two years. Now, what about government debt? I'll focus mainly on private debt here for time constraints and uh, because it's the one that economists ignore. But the, the fetish about worrying about government debt is ridiculous. That's one place I will agree with Krugman, and I'll take him one step further. There are three ways you can create money in an economy, and each of them add to demand when they happen. Banks can lend out more than they get back in repayments, and that credit fuels demand. Government can spend more than it gets back in taxes, and that government spending fuels demand. Or you can, your trade can exceed imports, and therefore when people bring back the American dollars and the English pounds they've earned from exports and convert them into Norwegian krona, the central bank is obligated to create the money for them, put it in their bank account. So those are the three ways 
you can create money. So a government surplus, in that sense, is like a bank wanting repayments to exceed new loans. They're both ways of destroying money. When that happens, you have a slump. You reduce the money supply and you reduce demand. Now, if the government tries to run a sustained surplus, you'll either have fallen economic growth or an increase in private indebtedness or both. So however inefficient governments are, and I'm a great critic of government bureaucracies, particularly those in education, we're driving me bloody balmy, <laughs> and enough of them, uh, you need governments to create money. They could frankly do it more effectively by dropping it out of a helicopter than by employing half the bureaucrats I know. But nonetheless, you need them to create the money, which the rest of us then use for a commerce. If you don't let them create the money, then growth will slow, all private endeavours will rise, and you'll create the conditions for your future crisis. So the whole idea of sound money, which is this fetish that politicians still have in their heads, particularly auto-liberals like Schäuble, they think that's putting money away for a rainy day. No, it's actually destroying money. And if you destroy the money, then to maintain economic activity, the private sector goes into further debt, or if they cease going into further debt, you have a slump. So when you have a sustained government surplus, you're setting yourself up for a crisis. And the best indicator of that was the American government. Despite all its rhetoric, all the arguments about balanced budget, etc., for thank God, most of the time it hasn't achieved that, but it did achieve a sustained surplus in 1920. And what happened in 1930? There were 10 years of a surplus in those years. We had a short surplus under, under Clinton over here. We had 10 years of a 1% of GDP surplus in the 20s. That should have made the American economy nice and robust. So why did the Great Depression occur? Because that so-called sound finance set up a situation of increasing private indebtedness and then a crunch when the debt stopped growing. So the sensible thing is to run a deficit of the order of 3% of GDP all the year. The target should not be zero. It should not be a balanced budget. It should be a sustained deficit to create part of the money supply the private sector needs. And the Americas averaged about 2.8% for the last 120 years. And when you take out the wars, it's still an average of about 2.6% of GDP. So running a deficit is a sensible thing. So... What do we do about theoclassical economics? This is, I've stolen this from Bill, Bill another, and two great Bills, Bill, Bi Bill White and Bill Black. <laughs> One's tall and thin, the other short and stubby. Both got great senses of humour. One used to run the uh, Bank of International Settlements Research Department. The other uh, used to run the savings and loans prosecution in America. Now, you wouldn't think a bloke this big, which the Bill is, could savage 300 banks and put 300 employees behind bars. But he did in the savings and loans crisis. How many people got jailed in 2008? One. Bernie Madoff. You know Bernie Madoff? Okay. What a great, what a great name for somebody who made off with the money. <laughs> so Bill is a, is a justified critic of the, of the wimpiness of regulators this time around versus his decisiveness back in the savings and loans crisis. And he's just coined this toad, I absolutely love it. He said it's not neoclassical, it's theoclassical. In other words, it's a theology, it's a religion, it's a belief system, an intricate, self-sustained belief system, but a belief system not based on empirical research and not based on good mathematics either. I call it mythematics, but they do not, math, not, not, not uh, mathematics. But if you look at what's happening now, you're finally finding neoclassicals, leading neoclassicals, coming out and saying there's something seriously wrong with our theory. This is, I'm going to give you a few quotes here. The starting premise is that there's a well-established model of macro and we should build models on that basis. You're saying, with, with, given the data, surprising nature of the data for the last decade, this is wrong. We simply do not have a settled, successful theory of the macro economy. Another one, there are many reasons to dislike current DSG models. They are based on unappealing assumptions. Now, when, since when have neoclassical economists criticised models for bad assumptions? They've criticised people who criticised them for bad assumptions in the past. Now they're saying the assumptions matter. They're not just simplifying, which is true. You have to have simplifying assumptions, no argument there. Their assumptions profoundly at odds with what we know about consumers and firms. In other words, they're not as-if assumptions. They're as-isn't assumptions. That's the basis of those assumptions. The third person, for more than three decades, macroeconomics has gone backwards. 
Models attribute fluctuations in aggregate variables to imaginary causal forces. Now, most people would think those sorts of remarks were made by me. I'd happily make all three of them, but I didn't. The first was Narayana Koshala Kotta, who was a president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, just retired from the role in 2016. And he was a, a staunch freshwater economist, as they call themselves. Olivia Blanchard, who was director of the IMF, economic director of the IMF. And Paul Romer, who is now World Bank chief economist and invented endogenous growth theory. So people of that stature, thankfully, are coming out and saying there's something seriously wrong with the theory. Narayana, Olivia and Paul. I've only, by the way, corresponded with two of them, Olivia and Narayana so far. So how come they're sounding like me? <coughs> because reality's hit them. And I knew we had to have something as serious as a financial crisis before people would realise just how useless, how totally distracting this plausible, neat and wrong theory of capitalism is. So realism's got in the way. Now, realism didn't matter when you were using a theory to bash your ideological opponents, but it does matter when you're trying to run an economy. And for th pretty much 40 years now, since the mid-1970s, neoclassicals have had the running of forming economic theory. And you can't use an unrealistic theory to model manage the real world. And here's Romer again saying that in response to the observation that shocks are imaginary, so the things that vary, that make these models fit the data, are imagined, made up to make the, the parameters are made such that you fit the data properly. He said people invoke Milton Friedman's methodological assertion from unnamed authority. There was no justification apart from a glib line from Friedman about the worse the assumptions, the better the model. And then he says, now what people say, oh, well, all models are false, to ignore the fact that their models completely fail to get the real data. And he beautifully described, I really highly recommend reading this paper because it's moderately technical as well. He said the non-committal relationship with the truth revealed by these methodological evasions goes so far beyond postmodern irony that it deserves its own label. He suggests calling it post-real. <coughs> it's Paul Roma, not me. Okay? But I totally agree with him, of course. There's tons of unreality, and this is some of the ways that Mar the Roma parodied the article, the, the theories in his books. He said you might as well have phlogiston. Anybody know what phlogiston is? It's, it's the imaginary substance that is chem chemistry enough to explain combustion before they discovered oxygen. A general type of phlogiston that increases consumption goods produced by given outputs, an investment-specific type for investment goods, a troll who makes random changes to wages, a gremlin who randomly changes the prices of output, ether, that's the stuff that we thought light passed through before we discovered uh, relativity and quantum mechanics, increases the risk preference of, and, and caloric making people want less leisure. And they're all totally justified jibes of these theories. So the models fit the, the data, uh, fit the past data well and the future terribly because if you jiggle about with all these magical things, you can fit this, these models to any set of data. You can fit it to the word humbug. I'm using the word humbug advisedly because there's a wonderful paper about theory of capital called the humbug production function. Highly recommend reading that one. They leave out key variables, but they fit the model to the actual data. So when the key variables change, and the dynamics change, the models fail abjectly. You can't just predict, you have to understand as well. And if you're blinding yourself to the factor of capitalism, you can't understand how it operates. You'll get systematically bad forecasts, which work well when the economy is on a trend and collapse completely when the trend goes in the opposite direction. So one thing the mainstream says is you've got to build models from the ground up. Micro foundations are essential. This is Olivia again in one of the articles I've quoted, basically saying, how else can you do it? Well, the logical deduction from that is don't work from the bottom, work from the top down. You're going to hate me for this stuff because there's a fair bit of math coming your way, but I'll do it quickly. I'm, I just start from simple definitions, the employment rate, the wage share of output, and the debt-to-GDP ratio. And I get these three inferences coming out of it. Employment will rise if growth exceeds pop population growth and labour productivity growth. Wage share will rise if wage demands exceed labour productivity. And the debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. That's obvious, aren't they? So I'm going to go through the maths really quickly. Anybody wants it, I'll put it up on my website. But taking those equations and putting in, just doing simple calculus to turn it into a set of dynamic terms, 
I then get that statement. That's the verbal version. Uh, the, the actual mathematics is here. Rate of change of employment over here. Growth rate, population growth and technical change. Same for the wages share of GDP. It's not hard. I'm not saying it would be impressive. This is simple calculus. One of my teachers used to describe this stuff as money for old rope. Okay. Once you know, a, a monkey can grind this stuff out. It's not hard. So it's not complicated. It's actually simpler than what neoclassicals do. Then I get that second statement. Do the, the debt ratio is so obvious that I don't bother explaining it. So you get three truisms, which I've just shown you. And you can't deny those. You can only deny them if you say debt doesn't matter. And I've shown you the consequences of doing that. And you can turn it into a model, not by needing complicated expressions of people's behaviour, but the simplest possible things will do. Because one of the insights from complex systems theory, which is what I recommend you learn rather than economics, is that the complexity of a system comes out of its structure. And incredibly simple statements of the model will give you the basic dynamics of the system. And then you want to get closer fit, you add the more realism later. So if you start from that, I just put in the extremely simple expressions, a constant capital output ratio, a constant labour productivity to, uh, ratio, uh, investment being financed by debt, a linear reaction of workers to the employment rate for wage demands and a linear reaction by capitalists to the profit rate for investment. And what I get out of it is a model that's inherently nonlinear. Now, it looks a bit scary to those who aren't used to mathematics, but actually it's an extremely simple set of expressions. There's three variables and about nine constants inside there. A bit scary for some, but not too bad. What you've got is nonlinearity. You've got employment rate times the negative of wages share and the debt ratio. Wages share times the positive of the employment rate. The, neg the debt ratio times itself and the wages share. And what you get is a model that gives us something in a very stylized way like what we experienced during the financial crisis. Now, if you set the parameters up so that the, the capitalists are very meek, you get a convergence to equilibrium. And that's what neoclassical thought was going on. They call it the great moderation. If you go for slightly more aggressive capitalists, more willing to invest and therefore borrow money to invest, you get apparent stability followed by breakdown. So what they thought was a moderation was actually a prelude to a crisis when you see it in a complex systems way. Now, all the difference is, is how willing the capitalists are to invest. So if I bring up this model now just using the flowchart side of the program, and I start with very passive capitalists who don't uh, particularly, don't react all that much to an increase in the profit rate in terms of their investment level, you get a nice smooth convergence to equilibrium. But if you have capitalists who are more willing to invest, if the rate of profit is higher than they anticipate, it looks like it's stabilising, but then it finally breaks down. Now, of course, that's an unrealistic model, very, very linear and so on. It doesn't look anything like the data, which is the comeback I'll get from neoclassicals about it. But if you elaborate to some extent, pardon me, wrong one, and have prices inside there and nonlinear behaviour as well, I haven't got a government sector here which would actually attenuate the crisis. But you get something just like what we've seen happening in real life in the sense of an apparent moderation followed by a breakdown coming out of nowhere, increasing inequality because workers are getting less and bankers are getting more, and without government intervention, the system crashes. So that's the real world we live in. And it's not impossible to model this stuff. It just needs to change your mindset. Get away from the equilibrium. Get away from micro up. Work from the macro down. We, we can actually build a realistic economics taking insights from complexity theory. By the way, historians are ahead of us. There's a guy called Peter Turchin who's about what he calls Clio Dynamics. I recommend people who are interested in this take a look at that work. It's doing what I think economists should have been doing, applying it to historical trends rather than just economic data. So that's the more complicated model I've just shown you a moment ago. And those are some of the dynamics coming out of it. Interestingly enough, the last people to know something is going wrong in the system of the capitalists. Okay. Because the declining amount going to workers is offset by a rising amount going to bankers until the debt starts to compound with deflation and the capitalists lose everything to the bankers, which is the sort of world we've got ourselves into. So this is the sort of world that we've been led into by a naive theory about how the world operates.
and we've now got to find a way to get out of it, which is not going to be easy. Now, I think I've talked enough time there. I'll take some questions quite happily. But I've got a book coming up on this issue and how we might get out of the crisis coming out in April and May. No equations will be here, please. No, they're on the website. It's just 25,000 words as well, explaining why the crisis occurred, why you've got stagnation in the West and why a second round is coming, I think, including Norway. And I'll also be starting a... You know, I want you to come to Kingston for the master's degrees we teach there. Anybody doing a master's degree? We're teaching this sort of approach, nonlinear dynamics, multi-agent modelling, complexity, and history of economic thought and economic history as well in a master's program. But you can also, if you like the work that I'm doing, you know I've got no financial support from the university sector in my lifetime. Okay. I've got a wage, which is great. I've got time to fly around and talk to audiences like this, but no research funding. So I'm going to try to raise that from the public through the Patreons appeal I'll start doing in about April, May. Thank you.